first part of chapter one of the first volume of the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by fredrik karlsson the life of reason by george santayana reason in common sense chapter one the birth of reason side note existence always has an order called chaos when incompatible with a chosen good whether chaos or order lay at the beginning of things is a question once much debated in the schools but afterward long in abeyance not so much because it had been solved as because one party had been silenced by social pressure the question is bound to recur in an age when observation and dialectic again freely confront each other naturalists look back to chaos since they observe everything growing from seeds and shifting its characters in regeneration the order now established in the world may be traced back to a situation in which it did not appear dialecticians on the other hand refute this presumption by urging that every collocation of things must have been preceded by another collocation in itself no less definite and precise and further that some principle of transition or continuity must always have obtained else successive states would stand in no relation to one another notably not in the relation of cause and effect expressed in a natural law which is presupposed in this instance potentialities are dispositions and a disposition involves an order as does also the passage from any specific potentiality into act thus the world we are told must always have possessed a structure the two views may perhaps be reconciled if we take each other with a qualification chaos doubtless has existed and will return nay it reigns now very likely in the remoter and inmost part of the universe if by chaos we understand a nature containing none of the objects we are wont to distinguish a nature such that human life and human thought would be impossible in its bosom but this nature must be presumed to have an order an order directly importing if the tendency of its movement be taken into account all the complexities and beauties all the sense and reason which exist now order is accordingly continual but only when order means not a specific arrangement favorable to a given form of life but any arrangement whatsoever the process by which an arrangement which is essentially unstable gradually shifts cannot be said to aim at every stage which at any moment it involves for the process passes beyond it presently abolishes all the forms which may have arrested attention and generated love its initial energy defeats every purpose which we may fondly attribute to it nor is it here necessary to remind ourselves that to call results their own causes is always preposterous for in this case even the mythical sense which might be attached to such language is inapplicable here the process taken in the gross does not even by mechanical necessity support the value which is supposed to guide it that value is realized for a moment only so that if we impute the chronos any intent to beget his children we must also impute to him an intent to devour them Side note. absolute order or truth is static impotent indifferent of course the various states of the world when we survey them retrospectively constitute another and now static order called historic truth to this absolute and impotent order every detail is essential if we wish to abuse language so much as to speak of will in an absolute where change is excluded so nothing can be or be conceived beyond it we might say that the absolute willed everything that ever exists and that the eternal order terminated in every fact indiscriminately but such language involves an after image of motion and life of preparation risk and subsequent accomplishment adventures all presupposing refractory materials and excluded from eternal truth by its very essence 
the only function those traditional metaphors have is to shield confusion and sentimentality because jehovah once fought for the jews we need not continue to say that the truth is solicitous about us when it is only we that are fighting to attain it the universe can wish particular things only in so far as particular beings wish them only in its relative capacity can it find things good and only in its relative capacity can it be good for anything the efficacious or physical order which exists at any moment in the world and out of which the next moment's order is developed may accordingly be termed a relative chaos a chaos because the value suggested and supported by the second moment could not have belonged to the first but merely a relative chaos first because it probably carried values of its own which rendered it an order in a moral and eulogistic sense and secondly because it was potentially by virtue of its momentum a basis for the second moment's values as well side note in experience order is relative to interests which determine the moral status of all powers human life when it begins to possess intrinsic value is an incipient order in the midst of what seems a vast though to some extent a vanishing chaos this reputed chaos can be deciphered and appreciated by man only in proportion as the order in himself is confirmed and extended for man's consciousness is evidently practical it clings to his fate registers so to speak the higher and lower temperature of his fortunes and so far as it can represents the agencies on which those fortunes depend when this dramatic vocation of consciousness has not been fulfilled at all consciousness is wholly confused the world it envisages seems consequently a chaos later if experience has fallen into shape and there are settled categories and constant objects in human discourse the inference is drawn that the original disposition of things was also orderly and indeed mechanically conducive to just those feats of instinct and intelligence which have been since accomplished a theory of origins of substance and of natural laws may thus be framed and accepted and may receive confirmation in the further march of events it will be observed however that what is credibly asserted about the past is not a report which the past was itself able to make when it existed nor one it is now able in some oracular fashion to formulate and to impose upon us the report is a rational construction based and seated in present experience it has no cogency for the inattentive and no existence for the ignorant although the universe then may not have come from chaos human experience certainly has begun in a private and dreamful chaos of its own out of which it still only partially and momentarily emerges the history of this awakening is of course not the same as that of the environing world ultimately discovered it is the history however of that discovery itself of the knowledge through which alone the world can be revealed we may accordingly dispense ourselves from preliminary courtesies to the real universal order nature the absolute and the gods we shall make their acquaintance in due season and better appreciate their moral status if we strive merely to recall our own experience and to retrace the visions and reflections out of which those apparitions have grown Side note, the discovered conditions of reason not its beginning to revert to primordial feeling is an exercise in mental disintegration not a feat of science we might indeed as in animal psychology retrace the situations in which instinct and sense seem first to appear and write as it were a genealogy of reason based on circumstantial evidence 
reason was born as it has since discovered into a world already wonderfully organized in which it found its precursor in what is called life its seat in an animal body of unusual plasticity and its function in rendering that body's volatile instincts and sensations harmonious with one another and with the outer world on which they depend it did not arise until the will or conscious stress by which any modification of living bodies inertia seems to be accompanied began to respond to represented objects and to maintain that inertia not absolutely by resistance but only relatively and indirectly through labor reason has thus supervened at the last stage of an adaptation which had long been carried on by irrational and even unconscious processes nature proceeded with all that fixation of impulses and conditions which gives reason its task and its pas de puy. nevertheless such a matrix or cradle for reason belongs only externally to its life the description of conditions involves their previous discovery and a historian equipped with many data and many analogies of thought such scientific resources are absent in those first moments of rational living which we here wish to recall the first chapter in reason's memoirs would no more entail the description of its real environment than the first chapter in human history would include true accounts of astronomy psychology and animal evolution end of chapter one part one